I'm Daryl Wanzer Serrano. I'm Ariana Ruiz. I'm Renee Rocha. And this is Imagining Latinidades. Thank you so much for joining us for our first full episode of Imagining Latinidades. Uh, this has been a, an exciting summer planning for all of the uh, the lectures that are going to be coming through at the University of Iowa this year uh, and getting ready to launch this podcast. We've really been looking forward to recording this first episode, but also I can't believe the summer has flown by as fast as it has. Like. Like you just got back, Ariana, from from California, right? Yeah, that's made it go by so much more quickly, I feel like. Um, Some originally from California, I got to spend some time with family out there, um, but also got uh, the opportunity to do some research out in Arizona as well as in Camarillo, California. So it's it's just been going by really quickly. Renee, you traveled too, didn't you? Yeah, I went to Texas. Um, So, but you know, like summer's over July 4th. That's my rule. So I've been mourning it for several, several weeks now. I like to prepare early for the eventual decline of our... How do you come up with this like July 4th rule? I just make up rules. Just, that's what I do. <laughs> well, uh, I, I did barely any traveling this summer. I went down to Texas for like a few days in an ill-fated kind of trip with the kids the, where we were basically stuck in the hotel the, the full time, which uh, thankfully it was a big room, but oh my gosh, a toddler and, a, and an infant stuck in a hotel room. Not exactly vacation. <laughs> it sounds like fun times. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we learned new we learned about new TV programs on uh, on the Disney Channel, so that was exciting. Um, so today uh, we're, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about our, ourselves a little bit to introduce uh, the listeners to who we are uh, and kind of where we come from and how we got the idea to start this podcast as part of this Imagining Latinidades programming through the Sawyer Seminar that we're hosting at uh, the University of Iowa. Um, And so this is kind of an episode of origin stories, both for us and for our programming uh, before we get going on the the kind of topical stuff uh, with uh, the more topical stuff with the next episode. And I think it'll be really interesting also to to really get a chance to hear um, that origin story, right? Because we are coming to the field from three very different uh, time periods, right? So thinking of myself as somewhat of the the baby of the group, um, I've been here four years, assistant professor. We have a, a an associate professor here and a full professor. Yep. Bravo, bravo. Congratulations. Right. Thanks, Ariana. Yeah, we have three diff- we're from three different geographic locations. We're in different fields. I feel like we're interested. We're sort of thematically connected here, but we're interested in lots of different topics. We even have different sort of methodologies. And so I really think that this is a pretty good holistic sort of um, perspective that we can bring here once once we're together. And, and to be honest, like, okay, so the three of us have worked together a lot. We put in many hours into the planning of of all of this Imagining Latinidade stuff. And I don't know that I know the origin stories for either of you. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. like, you know, yeah, yeah. it's like coming in after, you know, after after a series of superhero movies and finally getting the backstory uh, to learn kind of where where y'all are coming from. Uh, so I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I guess I, I think I think we should, we go by seniority. So, uh, Renee. All right. Thanks t- for making me feel old now, Daryl. Uh, you know, well, you, I mean, you're the one who was just who, before we started recording was talking about you know starting phased retirement. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, like, where, like, like. Where did you go to school? How did you get into, like, when did you know that you were going to get into Latina, Latina, Latinx studies? Yeah, pretty late. So I grew up in the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, I went to school there. Um, my father was actually an historian at uh, what was then Pan American University, eventually became University of Texas Pan American. It's now University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. Uh, I went there, I studied political science, um, decided I was going to go to graduate school. Wasn't really interested in these topics necessarily at all. I wanted to study public opinion or voting behavior. Um, and then I got to graduate school and a couple of different things happened. Um, one, I lived in the Rio Grande Valley my entire life and had that set of experiences. And now I found myself in central Texas, which is a very just culturally divergent experience. And that had sort of started a lot of questions generally around the idea of how different cultural environments, different sort of racial and ethnic environments affect 
just people's behaviors and attitudes. And at the same time, um, entering political science, so, you know, background, my PhD, I guess I should have mentioned this at the beginning, is in political science. Um, and in the sort of early 2000s, that field is not, you know, sort of perspectives on racial and ethnic studies, Latino studies, are just not very well represented. Uh, there's just not a lot of scholars uh, doing this work. Um, my field's primarily quantitative. There's not a lot of good data on this population at that point in time. And so there's just this real vacuum that I'm aware of as I'm going through graduate school, reading all this stuff, realizing that there's very little work from people who look like me and are sort of had the experiences that I've had. And so those two things combined, along with a sort of a really supportive academic environment and advisor, uh, sort of allowed me to sort of move into this area, uh, which, again, is not what I expected to do when I, when I started, but was something I committed to around, you know, the end of my first year in graduate school. Cool. So, so since that time, you've been focused. I mean, tell us a little, a little bit more about you know where your research has yeah. gone since then. And so, when I was in graduate school, my advisor was a sort of leading national expert on uh, racial and ethnic inequality in K through twelve education. And so, that's what my early work was focused on. And then, you know, so another one of those things where you know I, I moved to Iowa. It's my first experience really in the interior, and then I noticed that the immigrant experience within the interior is very different from the immigrant experiences I've understood it growing up on the border. And then I move here in 2006, which is also a point in time in which there's two major immigration raids, uh, Postville, Iowa, Marshalltown, Iowa. And that sort of begins an interest in how this n- relatively new phenomenon of enforcement of, uh, of immigration within the interior of the United States is affecting these communities. And so over time, really sort of my post-tenure period, I sort of s- hopped over out of the education policy area and into the immigration policy area. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if we're going by seniority, then Daryl. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I'm a, I'm a Boricua from Washington state. Uh, so I grew up out West, uh, did my undergraduate work at the university of Puget sound. Um, and ended up going to grad school, uh, at, at Indiana university. Um, and I, I, I write about this a little bit uh, in my in my book on the Young Lords. Um, I started graduate school not doing any Latino Latino studies stuff at all. Um, I was actually like I you know my my first year of graduate school, or I guess maybe it was my second year. The whole election two thousand fiasco happened, um, and I decided I was going to write a dissertation on ballots. Uh, but I was also really into psychoanalytic theory at the time. Uh, I come from uh, communication studies, from the humanistic, si- humanistic and critical side of communication studies. And so I was going to write a uh, dissertation on ballots as a sublime object of democracy. Yeah. Wow. It was very Zizakian. It would have been terrible. Uh, so uh, in what was supposed to be my last semester of coursework, so at least, you know, Rene got, got this going in his first year. For me, it was what was supposed to be my last year. Um, I was taking my last course, um, and the professor encouraged me to do some research related to my Puerto Rican heritage. Um, and this was the first, uh, professor who I was taking a class from who, who encouraged me in that kind of way. Uh, and so I grabbed an anthology and started reading and kind of ran across this, uh, this piece from the, from a member of the young Lords that was in the anthology. Um, and that was that I was hooked like for the, for the, really for the first time in my academic career, something was speaking to me on like a, a deeply felt level. Um, uh, and so, you know, from that point on, I started, yeah, there's no one. The, 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 there were few people around who were doing Latino Latino studies work, but I added some extra coursework with the people who were. Um, I started teaching in the Latino Latino studies uh, department or program at Indiana, um, and uh, and just really kind of haven't looked back since. Um, you know, my approach has evolved over the years, but. After I was done at Indiana and I took my first tenure track job, um, I, I kind of I quit that job to do the uh, what at the time was, I think, one of the only, if not the only Latino studies postdoc at the University of Illinois. And this is like 
2008, I guess. Uh, and that was another kind of transformative experience for me, just being around, really being in a Latina Latino studies program, soon to be department at that point, uh, and being around a whole bunch of different folks. It really changed my perspective and made me even kind of more committed to it. Um, so that's where that's where yeah. I come from. Yeah, it's interesting to see some similarities across our two experiences. Um, and that idea of having something sort of speak to you, seeing a void in a vacuum. I wonder if there, there are any sort of um, pressure against doing this sort of like, you know, what the, the colloquial term I think is like me search. Because it's one of the things oh, yeah. that I definitely struggled with in graduate school. Is I had a really supportive advisor who was really interested in this area. But the idea of, you know, being the Latino graduate student in your graduate program studying you know, Latino, in my case, Latino politics, right? Yeah. The, the sort of amount of social pressure from individuals outside that field is, is, makes it, made that transition pretty hard for me in my early years of graduate school. Sure. I mean, I think the difference for, for me is that my department was, you know, since it was uh, filled with folks who were kind of approaching things from more of a kind of cultural studies perspective, I think the uh, the idea of, one being connected to their research and having a set of a set of personal commitments that are t- and political commitments that are tied to their scholarly work that was that was a kind of commonplace thing uh, for the for the circle that I was running in. I think that there was pushback um, because uh, for a couple of reasons, right? Like one that here I was moving to a, to a dissertation topic that ostensibly no one in my department knew anything about. <laughs> Yeah. Or, or, you know, my, certainly my advisor didn't. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the kind of compromise there is that the, the dissertation kind of used a similar theoretical and critical framework uh, to what I'd been doing with the ballot stuff. So I was still, I was not, not so much the psychoanalysis, but dealing with like radical democratic theory um, and you know, infusing that in the in the dissertation project, which is all stuff that like is completely absent from my book, right? except for the moments where I'm kind of reflexive in my book and I'm like, hey, I, I was good, I was doing this, but here's why that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, there was definitely some of that pushback. Renee, I'm wondering, how did you then? Was there a moment where you broke away from that idea or didn't care as much about that sense of the Latino doing work on? Latino yeah, it takes a, I mean, it takes a lot to resist. Again, I think it was really helpful that I had uh, a supportive advisor and that I wasn't the only Latino graduate student in my program. So there are people and there are people a little bit more senior than me could, that could help encourage me. But, you know, there's just, a you know, that sort of pressure from, you know, some faculty, also a lot of peers, I think. Uh, when you're that young, I think it is really difficult. And the other thing that's, I think, different about the experience Daryl's describing uh, and there's maybe sort of a field difference here is that my field is not really clear on its willingness to embrace sort of strong normative commitments mm-hmm. and the idea of being normatively tied to the thing that you're studying as a, you know, sort of objective social scientist uh, also gets a little bit dicey. And it's taken me a long time to really get comfortable with the idea that, you know, for example, I study immigration policy again. I'm, I have a set of strong normative commitments here. And, you know, the social science is a social science. And so it's, you know, you're presenting a series of, you know, sort of data, but it's okay that the questions are informed by your normative commitments. It's okay that, the, um, you know, the things you emphasize out of your findings are, are informed by your normative commitments. And it's taken me a long time to get to that position. Yeah. Can I ask a follow up question yeah. on that? Yeah. So, like, to to what extent do you, I I find that the the people who often make the kind of arguments against me search, right, so called me search, right, against this like, you know, who who are arguing against having those kinds of normative commitments to the research that you're engaging in, uh, most oftentimes have some of the strongest unstated normative commitments, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. kind of you know, white studies basically, yeah. right? To this kind of like cultivation of a of a of an imagined universal that is essentially a kind yeah. of 
white political subject or audience or whatever. Um, you find the same thing in political science. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there was a professor at University of Texas named David Liao, and he had this joke that I would often repeat. So one of the major sources of survey data in political science is something called the ANES, the American National Election Study. Uh, he always called it the Anglo National Election Study, <laughs> right? Because most of the people in the data set are white. And so what happens is you're, you analyze the entire population in that data set and then you make claims that you are saying are generalizably true, but they're all based on, on sort of like on the white population and they might not be, you know, the, the effect, whatever effects you're uncovering may not apply equally across, you know, all racial or ethnic groups, but you're assuming that they do, but you know, you, you don't know that they do. And so you're actually making a series of statements about white political behavior and you're saying that they're just about political behavior generally speaking. And so, you know, sort of being aware of that and attentive to that is something that the field sort of generally speaking at the time in the early 2000s was just not really good about. I think the field's actually a lot better now. Uh, there's a new sort of cohort of young Latino politics scholars that I'm really excited about that are sort of moving up through the ranks, uh, starting jobs, just getting tenure. And so the effect, I think, is being felt broadly in my field. But it was a you know, very different world you know, 15, 20 years ago. But I do think we're all coming to Latino, Latina, Latinx studies from these very traditional fields, right? You're mm-hmm, coming mm-hmm. at it from political science, Rene. We have communication studies for Daryl and for myself, English, right? And so there is this sense of needing to uh, speak within the canon to a certain extent, right? And, yeah. that, and that's yeah. a traditional white canon. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about you, Aniana. Yeah. So um, I grew up in Inglewood, California, um, very working class neighborhood area city. Um, Parents immigrated from Mexico. So um, my experience in terms of even entering higher education and academia um, were very much that typical first generation um, student, right? So not really knowing how professors became professors, um, not really understanding the application process for colleges, et cetera. Um, I went to Inglewood High School and really there, especially at that time, um, it was just trying to kind of get you through high school. So I went to UC Santa Cruz for undergrad um, and I was very fortunate to sign up for my first Chicano studies class with Larry Trujillo, Chicanos and Social Change. Uh, that That's the class that really introduced me to both Chicano studies and then later on um, was my way of entering into Latina, Latino, Latinx studies. There I got the opportunity to, like I said, work with him as well as with um, other scholars like Kirsten Silva Gruez, who is in English. Um, and they really offered that opportunity for me to learn my history, um, the literature, the the political aspects behind what I was really interested in, which is really the, the Latina experience in the United States. Um, so I would definitely say that that I started off, there's people say like, oh, you go to college and you become a Chicana, right? That that was very much my experience. We had Mitch at, at Inglewood High School, but it wasn't necessarily a group I quite understood at that time. Um, so definitely going to Santa Cruz really offered that opportunity for me to, to see what was um, available within that field for me, things that interested me. Originally, I thought I was going to do education, K through 12, something like that. Um, I ended up doing our version of McNair, which was the faculty mentor- mentorship program, excuse me, um, and really offered an opportunity for me to to think about, okay, do I really want to go the K through 12 route or do I want to um, pursue a graduate program within English? All right, Anna. So tell us about how you made that transition then. How did you decide to end up leaving that idea of K through 12 and going to graduate school and eventually academia? So as I'd mentioned, I um, I was able to work with Kirsten Silva Gruez at Santa Cruz, um, and she was really one of the the people that made me think about graduate school and what that would look like, what that would mean. I'd had the experience of Chicanidad or Latinidad in um, California, and so one of the best things she could have ever said to me and encouraged me to do was to go away. Right. Um, And so she was the one who was like, look, Illinois, I know someone out there, Ricky Rodriguez. You might want to check him out. He 
he's pretty awesome. Um, and so I, among the various schools that I was applying to was Illinois, where I ended up going to uh, pursue my PhD in English. Um, and I did work with Ricky while I was there as well. Um, and so really thinking about what Latinidad looked like outside of California really changed my life, I would say. I joke with one of my friends. I'm like, I knew Puerto Ricans existed, but I'd never actually met one in California, especially not Southern California. Uh, so being out in Illinois, there was just such a mix and a different types of people that are all coming from, you know, Latin American Caribbean descent and what are their experiences? How are they the same or different from what I might've known in California that it, it really opened up my eyes in a way that, that helped me, I think, become a stronger researcher, um, someone that really wanted to try to to understand, right? So not going into it being like, I know this, I'm this is my background, right? Yeah, and the other similar theme I think we're picking up here is that, you know, moving from South Texas to Central Texas isn't the same as moving from uh, Southern California to Santa Cruz to, to Illinois, but we're still hitting on this idea that as you experience different environments and you realize that, you know, sort of it's informing this idea that our identity, the way others perceive us, is uh, changes quite dramatically across space. And really, that's what's informed a lot of my research. So I'm really interested in this idea of movement, of travel. As an undergrad, I got the opportunity to tr study in England uh, for a semester. And so that actually was part of what I was wanting to do research on in Illinois uh, to do a transnational project on migrant narratives, uh, both in the U S and in the UK, seeing some of those similarities, right? That changed once I was in Illinois and started actually doing coursework and special fields and dissertation perspective and all that stuff. Um, nevertheless, there is that sense of movement and what that offers for uh, a subject in motion, right? But also at the same time, thinking about these questions of, citizenship, of nationality, of belonging that very much make themselves um, apparent in our Sawyer seminar, right? How you can be here for such a long time. And again, it's like the current uh, political moment right now is, is offering so many opportunities and so many links to what we're talking about because you can be here, be born here, have roots in the U.S. and still be uh, read as a foreigner, right? Yeah. You know, this is what I love about the institutionalization of Latinx studies at the University of Iowa is if you look at your work and you look at my work, I mean, on the face of it, these are just completely different, uh, you know, s sets of papers and, and research. But there's so much similarity here, right? Even though the fields are different, the words are different, the approaches are different, the fundamental questions and the way in which we're sort of really, you know, sort of angling at the question it has so much symmetry and without the institutionalization of this program here and why other universities that sort of maybe don't have these heavily institutionalized programs, you know, would, would really need to benefit from creating them and making them vibrant is that we can really see that once we're in, you know, conversation with one another and we can use that to sort of inform our work in really amazing ways. So talk about overlap while Daryl was at Illinois, I also happened to be there as a graduate student and really thinking about the space and the type of conversations that were fostered in the Latino Studies program there, um, I think offers also an opportunity to have us talk about Latino Studies uh, here at Iowa. Yeah, and that was a, such a key moment at Illinois because it was right around, I was there 2008 to 2009, and I think it was the next year that it went from having just a minor to having a major and then also becoming a department and not and not simply a program. And we've been going through, you know, we've gone through, I think, a, a trajectory that that we hope someday is going to match that same kind of trajectory that uh, that Illinois had. Um, so, we, so we should talk about that a little bit, because I think that yeah, you know, there's still while there while while Latino Latino Latinx studies has been around for 50 years in some parts of the country, uh, there are still you know quite a few universities that don't have uh, a very kind of like institutionalized form of Latino Latino Latinx studies, um, and so talking about like our kind of 
quick development in some ways here at Iowa, I think might be useful to some of you out there in the audience land. Quicker or very long, depending on what your starting point is, right? Uh, So, you know, I mentioned I came here in about 2006. um, And so I actually came here on a cluster hire that was a provost initiative where they were going to hire uh, a senior scholar in Latino studies, uh, two assistant professors. They hired two assistant professors, myself and an historian. Uh, who's no longer here, and then the senior search failed. And then um, the historian and I, absent any sort of way of institutionalizing ourselves, right, just hung out in our home departments and got tenure in our home departments like good assistant professors. And then really it takes the arrival of other bodies. So you, you, know, you, you people arrive and then you have finally um, some, you know, I get tenure, Omar Valero Jimenez, who's the historian that they hired, gets tenure. And finally, there's some effort to sort of begin to uh, institutionalize the program. And so, uh, geez, I don't even remember the starting date, but what was it, 20... It was 2014 is when the minor was officially formed. And that that came on the heels of a a symposium here at the university called the Latina, Latino, Latinx Midwest. And it was, I think, a day-long symposium and some follow-up events too that generated a lot of interest from students. And it was really, and this is like, this is often the case around the country. It was student demand, student input, uh, uh, for starting some kind of, of of institutionalized structure to be able to do Latino Latino Latinx studies at the university, and so the 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 Midwest thing was like 2012, I believe. Mm-hmm. I think it was my first year here. That was Omar, mm-hmm. Claire Fox, and Santiago Vaquera Vasquez. Yes. Okay. Yep. yep. Uh, and of those three, Claire is the only one who's left here at the university. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was 2014, uh, I think late 2014, that the minor was kind of officially approved or went through the process. Um, and I don't think we started getting students enrolling until maybe a year later. Yeah, And then even then, I feel like it's sort of, as you would expect, it's sort of this program on on paper, right? Uh, so there's a minor, there's a series of courses uh, that are all sort of cross-listed. And it's, I mean, that's how things start. It's really important. But there's not a, I think you begin the sense of community from the student perspective, but from the faculty perspective, there's still not that sense of, of community. And that I think is what's starting to change now with this seminar that we're going to talk about is really sort of cementing and is going to help us sort of move forward, as you say, sort of, thinking about how we create a major here at the University of Iowa and how we eventually sort of perhaps uh, move into a, a, a much more you know, robust uh, type of space. And I think that's one of the important things to highlight as well is that it's not only just creating a community but an intellectual community where we do have all of these people that are talking to one another that are coming together under Latina, Latino, Latinx studies but would otherwise be in their home departments. So it, it does give this, this way of really thinking about intellectual exchange amongst all of us, the, the three of us, in, for example, here today. Yeah. I mean, and it's for all, I think for all of us, it is still the case that we're basically the only ones that are home departments that do this kind of work. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, it is, that that gets a little, I mean, intellectually lonely. Um, it's 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 difficult being kind of like in that you know kind of closed off in that space, and so to be able to have the opportunity to get together with folks who at least have have a, a some kind of idea of what you're talking about, right? Uh, of the of the topic of the you know perhaps of the of the particularities of your methodologies. Um, and but have that experience and have a, a, a real kind of true interest in that is uh, is, is really exciting, right? I mean, it, it it makes for a much more productive and fruitful experience on the tenure track or after tenure or uh, or you know just in this scholarly and academic context. Yeah. So uh, should we talk about the Sawyer seminar? Yeah. Talk about, yeah, and how we're sort of using that to further a lot of these efforts? 
Yeah. So, you know, the, the Sawyer, the opportunity to apply for the, for the Sawyer seminar, which if you don't know what that is, this is a, a Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded program. Uh, the Mellon Foundation invites uh, certain universities to, uh, to apply uh, for a Sawyer seminar every year. Uh, Iowa, you know, happened to be invited, uh, uh, I guess it's now a couple of years ago that this process started for us. Um, is it really, has it really been, have we been working on this that long? Um, and they invited us, I, I think right about the time that we were uh, gaining program status, which, you know, doesn't, didn't actually like change a ton of stuff, but it gave us the opportunity to like really start forming that intellectual community in kind of formalized ways. Like Renee and I uh, were able to move portions of our lines to Latino Latino studies um, and other faculty are, are, are able to do that now as well. And so this is kind of a key opportunity where we're like, okay, this is fine. This is really happening now. The miners growing, uh, and over the last year, it grew like you know exponentially, um, and you know, but still, there isn't enough kind of understanding in across the university or even across the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences about what Latino Latino studies is, right, uh, and what it can be, and why it's something that's worth knowing about, uh, and so when the Sawyer seminar call went out, we just kind of like started yeah, I think Renee and I first started talking we we're like hey maybe we should hey, we should figure out something to do yeah yeah and um you know it really begins this idea I mean that was one of the most educative experiences for me mm-hmm. right it begins the idea of like really forcing us in the conversation because we have to figure out like what's it going to be about what are the themes going to be about and then we have to start engaging one another in a much more intellectually serious way and uh, you know, especially from my perspective, again, being the sort of quantitative social scientist in the group, that really forces me to engage sort of more traditional uh, Latino, Latino Latinx studies in a, in, a, in a much more in-depth way than I ever had before. And so I've been really appreciative for the seminar, for the space, uh, in helping me sort of evolve as an academic. Yeah, the application process. You know, we we brought. Uh, you know, we decided that that we needed a third person, and Ariana was like, "Yes, this is the perfect person to 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 bring in on this." Um, and we got to talking. I think the first topic we had was. I think we initially were kind of talking about food in part because right. some other folks were kind of signaling that that would be interesting. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. You're right. Yeah, we and, were thinking about food, and we and we were like, "Oh yeah, food. Like we like to eat. We like to talk about food." We're like. Do any of us actually know anything about like food studies scholarship and and realize? And I was like, no. Yeah. But that's where we started talking about our research and our yeah. work and what might be again some of these overlaps, these these ways that we're talking to one another through Latinidades, right? Through that experience, especially here in the Midwest, and that's really where we we came up with this idea of imagining Latinidades. How is it imagined by an outside? an outsider and how was it imagined within the group itself? Yeah. And that's the, that became the kind of like exciting nexus for us is thinking about all these different ways that Latinidades gets crafted. Um, and we, we kicked around different kinds of terminology and settled in on this articulating, you know, this notion of articulation, right. And imagining Latinidades that there is no, you know, we talked about this briefly in the trailer. There is no singular homogenous Latinidad, right? I think the scholarship is pretty, you know, has, has come around to that and is pretty clear about that. Um, but instead, there's like lots of lots of different possibilities for how Latinidades can be crafted, can be discussed, can shape other kinds of you know political activities and cultural activities, um, and how that relates to formal and informal notions and experiences of belonging. Uh, and as we got talking about that, we're like, okay, yeah, like, these are all terms that each of us has some familiarity with and, uh, and, and, and uses in, in one way or another in, uh, in our own fields. Uh, and that's how the, 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 the theme started to really kind of crystallize for us. And we are thinking about that genealogy to a certain extent, right? In terms of what does the Latino, Latina, Latinx experience mean 
how does it evolve? How does it change? And how do we envision it in the future as well? And that's really the trajectory that we've also thought of in terms of the seminars themselves. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's an important lesson um, for us to share with our community, both our community here at the University of Iowa, but also the community generally, Iowa City, the state of Iowa, um, and, you know, other, all of our events will be available online. And so, so, you know, just, you know, everyone, because I think that's really the central question that a lot of individuals in this Midwest U.S. space are going to have to deal with. Yeah, yeah the, the fact that we've had, you know, high profile deportations here in Iowa City, right? Uh, the idea that the border is just that strip of land across the southern part of the United States, right, is really kind of like thrown out the window when you have these, you know, Renee mentioned Postville and um, Marshalltown, Marshalltown yeah. Yeah. Um, for when he first moved to town. Um, and these are this is regular experience here in Iowa now, right? The yeah. border, you know, the border travels. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, the border, West Liberty, Iowa is a town about 20 miles away from Iowa City. It's uh, majority Latino, right? And so there, but uh, other places in Iowa are, you know, not that. And so you have sort of these mini borders that exist within the states where there's these very clear lines of demarcation between these very diverse environments and these extremely traditionally Iowan 90 plus percent white environments and, you know, navigating those borders that exist sort of within the, the state, you know, uh, sort of like scattered all over the place, I think is um, one of the things which has really surprised a lot of individuals when they sort of learn about the state and also been this sort of existential crisis that is occurring, you know, w- within the area. I think for a lot of students as well on campus, just thinking about that border as well, that division between campus life and community life Mm -hmm. and the Latino community that is present in Iowa City, where are they seen? How are they not seen in certain instances? Uh, It it also offers opportunities for those conversations to take place. I have a number of students that I've worked with where I'm like, well, Latino does not equal Latin America. (laughs) <laughs> right. So thinking about those border crossings, how are mm-hmm. they tied to it? What are some of the differences? What are some of the nuances to it? Um, and so thinking about all of that in conversation um, with the wonderful set of scholars that we're going to be bringing mm-hmm. in throughout the academic year. Yeah. And to and to be doing that uh, in a space that isn't closed off on the campus, I think is one of the things that we've been excited about from the beginning. So nearly all of our speaking events, uh, and there's six of them in total, are going to be at the Iowa City Public Library and open to the public. And as Renee mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, they're going to be live streamed and going to be recorded and available online. Um, and that that aspect of public engagement is is part of the reason why we decided to also host this podcast because there's a lot of really exciting stuff that happens within the academic context in Latina, Latina, Latinx studies that creates a space for, uh, for Latina, Latina, Latinx students on our campuses uh, and generates, you know, knowledge that, uh, that, that is the, the whole campus benefits from. Uh, but Latina, Latina, Latinx studies has always been committed to that connection to community. Uh, and so one of the things that, that we want to be doing in this podcast as we, as we keep moving forward is thinking about, okay, you know, we're talking about some scholarship related to migration, for example. Well, you know, what does that mean in our in our scholarly context? Like, how do those different arguments shape how we understand a particular set of issues and histories and contexts? Uh, but also, why does that matter for people outside of the university context? Right? How does that matter to you know for us, the Iowa City community, the state as a whole, the country, for people who aren't like living their lives on campuses? Uh, in the publisher parish life uh, and are, you know, instead living their lives, you know, in the world, right? So the Sawyer Seminar allows funding to bring in folks that would perhaps not have been able to come out to Iowa City uh, of our own accord, given that we are 
uh, a fairly new miner and and still working out, you know, our budget and all that stuff. Um, and so really thinking about it as this this introduction to Latino studies to the community at large um, and offering lots of growth and potential for the minor um, someday major. Yes, it'll happen. Uh, so what are some of the things that are coming up next? So our next episode, which is two weeks away, uh, will feature two of the fellows who are part of our Sawyer seminar this year. So the our, our postdoc, Lisa Ortiz, and one of our dissertation fellows, Rachel Torres, uh, both of whom do uh, Latina, Latina, Latinx studies work. Uh, Lisa focusing on uh, educational context uh, in, in migration in the Midwest. Uh, and Rachel... Uh, who's currently writing her PhD in the Department of Political Science, uh, focusing uh, her work on immigration policy and how immigration policy affects issues of sort of like ethnic identity amongst the Latino population. So we're going to talk to these two early career scholars about what Latino Latino studies means to them uh, at these stages in their careers and kind of what they're looking forward to uh, in terms of the conversations that will unfold over the course of the Sawyer Seminar year. So that'll be two weeks from now. Uh, Please listen in. And with that, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Twitter uh, regarding anything that was mentioned today or things that you'd like to hear about in the future. Our Twitter handle is at Imagining Lat. Um, and please be sure to also follow or like our page on Facebook. Uh, you can shoot us an email at podcast at imaginingLatinidades.com. Thanks for listening. And please be sure to check the show notes for links to any of the things that were mentioned today. Great. Thanks so much. Bye, y'all.